uh, welcome to the second session of the webinar and the session theme of the session is china in central asia and west asia and russia so we have dr km sajad ibrahim professor department of political science and director of ugc hrdc center uh, to chair the session uh, sir i invite you to chair the session okay thank you ashika good afternoon good afternoon to all of you welcome to second session it is titled on china in central and west asia and russia as a part of an introduction i would like to few comments this is a very important region although the region in the sense that west asia and central asia are different and russia is also a border area which is also something different from the, the rest of the region so china china's role begin with the central asia as you know that um central asia has emerged as a very important region only in the aftermath of uh, the fall of the soviet union for example that means they liberated totally when soviet union collapsed so now the central asian region central asian states have been moving in the process of a restructuring economically politically even socially to a greater extent uh, here china has been playing a greater role in the sense that the rate of investment made by china in this region is quite large um if you examine the way in which china is so you know china's interest in the region is very very uh, you know uh, very strong because china is expecting a lot of benefit out of this region uh, this region um, you for example the states like kazakhstan kyrgyzstan tajikistan turkmenistan you know all the most of the countries here kazakhstan is uh, the most uh, leading country in the region and this is a potential country in the sense that because of uh, um, you know richness prosperity all and here china is playing the leading role for its uh, development and the same is also the case of uh, the other regions also so the india region is uh, depending on china for all types of assistance economic assistance economic assistance in the sense that not a free assistance of course we all know that china is investing a lot of money for the, in the restructuring process so i'm not going for um, the kind of controversies because i heard that in kazakhstan there were some people's movement in the the very active role of china in in the the state uh such minor issues were there in some some um uh, years i have noted earlier so this is the overall picture about the china central asia it's quite comfortable china is quite comfortable in the restructuring process of uh, central asia then again you can see that in the case of uh, west asia west asia is very interesting you know that west asia is a very complex region in the sense that uh, the states a uh, lot of uh, alliances you know uh, host it's a kind of uh, a region where so many hostilities still exist between the countries politically very active unlike uh, central asia it is very active region historically a lot of uh, significance in this region where israel is uh, something different from the rest of the region israel is an artificial country as you all know that artificially created in the year 1948 uh, so all the countries remaining countries uh, were keeping a distance uh, from israel and now many of the many of them are uh, passively uh, you know supporting israel in the sense that because american intervention and the the, the kind of uh, pressure from other region and if you take the case of saudi arabia saudi arabia is a leading country in the region another re leading country in the region but again you can see that it is a sunni prominent uh, country against uh, china you can see uh against saudi arabia we, we can see the presence of iran the powerful iran is also there very controversial country in the sense in the eyes of uh, western countries uh Iran is a dominant uh, Shia community, another sectarian of a sectarian country against uh, Sunni, and there is a kind of hostility between Saudi Arabia and uh, Iran, and also many countries. All most of the Sunni uh, 
dominant countries are against uh, Iranian way of uh, ruling, for example, Islamic revolution, so something different. Now here, how China is managing this atmosphere is very interesting. For example, China's approach to each and every country in this region is different from another, unlike in the case of Central Asia, where economic is the only thing. Here, China is very much interested in Iran in the sense that supporting defense kind of things, defense support and all other kind of things. For example, in the aftermath, in the, in the immediately after the Tiananmen Square, you know, the China faced a lot of economic blockade. Uh, but I think in the West Asia, its policy towards West Asia dramatically shifted to, you know, uh, towards, West, uh, towards uh, West Asia, especially Iran. China's policy towards Iran was one of the reasons for uh, China got the benefit of liberating, freeing from the economic sanction because China was supporting Iran to a greater extent in its, uh, in its uh, uh, you know, with a, a new building of new Iran. Uh, so America came forward that warning China not to give much assistance uh, to Iran that particular period of time, I remember. And uh, for that purpose, as a part of concession, a lot of benefits were given to China. That means uh, relaxing the economic blockade one by one. But China continued. Although China agreed with American um, uh, stand of, uh, you know, stopping some of the defense uh, deal with uh, Iran, but supporting China, uh, sorry, supporting China, supporting Iran uh, on many occasions, on many on many, many fronts. For example, in the in the um, process of. Uh, uh, supporting for example defense kind of even nuclear nuclear power plant kind of uh, uh, building process or and if you take the case of china's role in in other parts one important point i have to note down that china is not at all involved in any political controversies there so china is the only country only major country in the region where it is so much getting acceptability or that means all the countries in the region welcome china there is no permanent uh, foe or uh, enmity towards China, all the countries. So it is very rare. For example, if you take the case of Russia and America, they have a lot of alliances. Russia is not very much acceptable as far as some countries are concerned. America uh, is also not that, for example, Iran and uh, some other countries view America as something different. But in the case of China, it is totally acceptable in the sense that China's perception is different. China's policy is different. China is looking for a kind of uh, economic support, investment, the economic benefits out of this region. And China was uh, taking part in all the development and infrastructure support. So this is the overall picture. I'm not going for the details because of the lack of time. And we have very interesting presentations uh, here. We have uh, three presentations, first by Dr. Uh, sorry, I, I, I left it. Uh, Russia also. I would like to make a few comments on the China-Russia. As uh, you all know that, China Russia combination is very powerful nowadays. They are making a lot of, uh, um, you know, alliances and a lot of uh, uh, cooperation in its uh, pact against America. And it has been there since, uh, you know, uh, with the collapse of the Soviet Union. So Russia China uh, deals are quite very powerful in that sense against the China, against uh, um, America. And they are very strong. And America also has a lot of apprehensions about the way in which uh, China, Russia kind of uh, collaborations are moving. And uh, what only one point where China and Russia has some kind of uh, disagreements on the role in which China is playing in Central Asia. That is also very interesting. I don't know whether it would it would be going it, it, it would be a kind of an issue in the future. That we have to wait and see. And I think uh, the we have we have some presentations also. Sometimes uh, they would also make a kind of a comments on this issue. So anyway, we have a lot of uh, we have uh, three presentations here. First one by Dr. Nanda Kishore. He'll be uh, speaking on China and West Asia. Second one by Dr. Uma Purushottaman, and she will be um, presenting a paper on China and Central Asia beyond a peaceful periphery. Then third one by Mr. Amal PP, and it is on China and Russia. So I would like to invite Dr. Nanda Kishore. Uh, to present a paper on China and West Asia. The first one remark, one important uh, uh, instruction, one other important, uh, not a condition. The request is that you have to limit your presentation to 12 minutes. And the Kishore is my, all of them are my friends. So I am uh, very liberal to that one. But you have to limit, please. 
12 12 uh, because 12 million josuti is very much adamant about that because on the as a policy of uh, punctuality so he also gave us the comment that we have to strictly um, you know adhere to the the time limits so please present your paper within 12 minutes all of them will be getting uh, around 12 minutes okay so okay please and uh, kishore you are welcome thank you um professor sajad uh, for a kind words and then i also thank my dear friend josukuti for this particular opportunity and taking an initiative uh, to start off 2022 this is my first one in 2022 i have many more to come but uh, always special when it's your friends uh, program my special thanks to him my thanks also to my co panelists um, and dr dr umar and the other uh, scholar who is also presenting here now um, keeping in mind the time that's been given to me i'll certainly uh, keep up to it and then i will uh, just share my uh, screen i have a small presentation to be made and that should be easy uh, are you able to see my screen can someone respond is my yes, screen yes, visible uh, as visible as visible okay uh, the topic that's been given to me is china and west asia um, and uh, partially uh, dr sajad spoke about but there are a lot more other things that have come in, in on which i have also written uh, in recent times the type of posing up that the chinese are doing with regard to uh, uh, west asian states uh, to many other issues how they are actually also trying to take up medal lot of other things that are also happening let's quickly go in so that we we are into specifics we don't uh, wander around to too many other things now for the one last decade that we are seeing that means let's say from 2010 even prior to that one the chinese were engaging but from 2010 the problem here uh, we see is some sort of a disengagement of the united states uh, perhaps every time when there is a vacuum for someone else someone uh, some other power tries to come in on the one hand we have a friction when uh, a, a great power is actually coming into picture to replace a super power we'll always see this uh, this happening and here it was much more easy for the chinese to come in because of the withdrawal of the united states to a large extent except for there here uh, they were they had their interest to pitch in where um, where they would want to interfere other than that one they did not show any constructive engagement now this is precisely why the chinese almost had a red carpet to come in now regional power that includes uh, iran israel russia saudi arabia and turkey have also been responding by seeking new allies and also competing more fiercely with one another in the sense when when the united states was there russia was much more interested but now it sees it as a very easy one but it has its own resource issues and many other problems that are associated but it would not want to give up for simple example is syria where it would want to uh, retain a lot of its control over the syrian territory specifically for the for tartars where it has its own naval base and its support that it would never want to give up but given the type of dynamics that are running in iran wants to throw its hat and wants to have regime changes in lot of places they would want to influence you have israel which is which is the lone country uh, with non islamic country that has that has problem that has to deal with you have raised spoke about russia already saudi arabia has been comparatively a traditional power since the 1930 and they have not been uh, displaced by anyone and they are growing more and more stronger and rmbs and you have turkey which is which is living the neo ottoman dream under uh, uh, erdogan now erdogan wants to show that he is capable of he can relive the dreams of the ottoman empire and and this is how the whole regional dynamics is happening now taking advantage of all these internal struggles and the problems and the withdrawal of the united states china has significantly increased its economic political and to a lesser extent security front uh, footprint investation in the past decade becoming the biggest trade partner and external investor for many countries in the region i think you must have seen the first slide where i had few pictures where he is standing with the mbs he is standing with uh, rohani he is standing with so many other people that's that's the level of engagement that the chinese are able to have there now beijing was already the largest buyer of the region's oil there's no doubt about it now without a fanfare it has become Uh, the only outside power that has strong political as well as trading ties with major uh, or most of the countries uh, there itself now with the launch of the bri which many other scholars also discuss since morning the type of uh, overlapping the type of spillover effect that it's been having i think west asia becomes very very strong space for 
for the Chinese to invest, Chinese to leave their dream. Now, the Chinese government here essentially decided to expand its influence uh, across the spectrum in, South, uh, in West Asia itself, uh, as they have been doing in other places. Europe has already been, uh, what is a completely mesmerized by it and smitten by the Chinese presence. Now that has also been happening in the West Asian region. Excuse me, sir. Yeah. Sir, your presentation is not visible. But I was told it's visible. Uh, is it visible now? No, Nanda Kishore, it is not coming. I thought that you are presenting already already. That's why I was asking. No, I, I am actually presenting. Uh, it's not coming. No, it's, it's not appearing. OK. Is it appearing now? No, no. Oh, God. I think I don't have permission to share my screen, I believe, if I'm right. Maybe. OK, OK. Is it is it appearing now at least? No. So you can use the present now option. Where is the present now option here? Uh, the, the middle one. Middle one, there is an arrow. Hand? The middle one, you can see. No, no, hand, not hand. The other one. Yeah, present now option, but what exactly? A tab? Or a window? Yeah, yeah, very close to the next tab. To the no, no, I'm asking. In that, they have there are three options: an entire screen, a window, and a tab. Uh, so you can do a window. Do a window. Is uh, this NDFs, okay? NDFs, now NDFs. now you're able to see. Is it appearing now? Yeah, yeah. it's appearing. Now. Yeah. Yes. Okay, fine. I I just finished this particular slide. And, and typically now China still has a limited appetite for challenging the US-led security architecture from that perspective. There's no doubt about it in West Asian region itself or playing a significant role in the regional politics, which is which it feels that it will get into unnecessary problems. But off late, it's been trying to do so. But on the security front, it's not very, very confident. Now, as a strategically important uh, crossroad for trade routes and sea lanes linking Asia to Europe and Africa, West Asia is very, very important to the future of the BRI itself, which is designed to place China at the center of global trade networks. There where China wants to be there as well. Now, for the moment, China's relationship with the region focuses on Gulf states to a large extent. If you look at the type of trade relations that they've been having due to their predominant role in the energy markets itself. Now, other uh, important factor is also uh, the vision of the multipolar order in West Asia based on non-interference and then the having uh, a typical type of partnership with other states uh, is where you will see here, uh, they are trying to push the narrative of the development piece uh, uh, rather than the democratic piece because certainly democracy is not something that the Chinese will ever endorse. Neither they think that it is important because it's Western. That's one. Second, they themselves are not a system that, that endorses uh, democracy. So they are pushing the developmental piece where they think in democracy, where you are not able to feed your people is of no important importance or it is of no use to people. Whereas developmental piece is much more important. At least it will feed people three times, which is which is crucial for the survival itself. Now, this is the Belt and Road Initiative, which you can see crossing through the, the Gulf region to everything that we are uh, specifically seeing here with regard to uh, the West Asian region itself, we can see Khalifa port to all sorts of places where they have their own um, understanding, where you have the maritime Silk Road, the new Silk Road and economic belt, then the economic corridors in which all of them would, uh, would want to have presence because of their PLA and anti-piracy missions that are already existing. But apart from that also, they would want to have their presence much more strategically in all these places. And it's become a very, very important region connecting most of the places that they want to now uh, if, if if again what i was uh, trying to say is now given the recent uh, series of incidents in the straits of hormos that the increased tension between iran and the geopolitical opponents uh, of, of west asia more specific to saudi arabia china could be forced to take on a greater security role to protect the freedom of navigation crucial to its uh, energy security. It might not be interested in the politics of these states, but it will be interested in undisrupted uh, disrupted, uh, energy supply that it is, uh, it, is, it is so crucial for it. Now, already China has developed comprehensive strategic partnership with Saudi Arabia, Egypt, and the UAE, because when we say, when we say Arab world, we can't leave out uh, uh, Egypt, because there are two non-Arab states, even in West Asia, one is Turkey, other one is Iran. 
Now, while its influence in Iran has increased significantly following the signing of a 25-year cooperation plan with Tehran itself. Now, the Chinese tech companies are involved in most of the important technological projects in the region, such as Smart Dubai 2012 that, that has already been realized, Saudi Arabia's National Transformation Program that is 2030, which is also a dream program of uh, Mohammed bin Salman or MBS. He certainly wants the Chinese presence and he also wants it to be conducive in nature. That's the plan that he has. Now, the Belt and Road Initiative envisages the creation of a vast network of railways, highways, energy pipelines, and the building of 50 special economic zones. Uh, more than 60 countries have signed the BRI project, in which China has already spent more than 200 billion uh, on such products. But according to some estimates, this amount could be raised to US dollar 1.2 trillion by 2027, given that it has to remain the same and COVID scenario has to help out China. It's also one of the biggest countries in terms of loss that has happened to the GDP, which has not been disclosed. But I think when the overall world GDP has gone down by, let's say, 1.5% to 1.8%, I think it's the Chinese also who have, who have lost it in a big way. Now, in the face of the inconsistent policies from the US and with an eye to a future with greater Chinese power and influence, Leaders in West Asia have been receptive to Chinese outreach so far. If you look at the type of conflict that exists between Iran and Saudi Arabia, Iran and Israel, Saudi Arabia and, and Turkey, and the type of dynamics that are happening where they are trying to be in groupings for which economics is, is very, very important. We have seen how after the Arab Spring, most of the states had to restructure themselves. They had to go for structural adjust adjustment programs to a lot of other things from employment to everything. And it is very, very important that they need money. And that money has to be for long term. And they see Chinese as the people who can do this one. Now, the BRA also addresses the domestic development concerns uh, and at the same time signals Beijing's intention to become more invested in, in the region. It's not that people are naive in West Asia that they don't know or any of the states, states don't know that Chinese ambitions are these and these. But there, at the same time, there is, there is an inevitable vacuum which cannot be filled by anyone else at this juncture other than the Chinese, where others have taken a back seat and they're interested more in politics. The Chinese are interested more in money. And that's exactly what many of the states want. Now, this comes at a moment when the Western countries, particularly US, suffers from West Asia fatigue. Now, it has come to a stage where it is a fatigue and it cannot just go back and it, it suffers and it, it, it's been haunting it. And whatever they have done, whether it is It's also hard to determine whether this is merely a hedging strategy designed to uh, diversify their extra regional partner, power partnerships or it is uh, the signals that beginning of a realignment that stretches across West Asia to East Asia that is yet to be ascertained. But it's clear, however, that China will be an engaged partner with a clearly articulated approach to building a stronger presence. They're concerned about the American presence, which is security presence. When, whenever they want to, they can escalate. With the Chinese, don't have capacity to uh, disrupt that. The Chinese don't have a capacity to face the Americans at this juncture, though they might be powerful and all this thing. But they can do that in their home turf, not in an unknown region or not in a region that's not theirs. And then they, it will simply lead to different type of escalation, which they are not ready to. They know the cost of war. They know the cost of escalation. They know how deterrence works as well. So, but unfortunately, COVID things have also brought in a lot of changes. But at the same time, the Chinese have been very, very cautious to deal with the West Asian region. They would want to have greater presence in many of these things. Otherwise, I, I also had few more slides to show or I had prepared some of them on individual investment in many of these states. But but because of the positive of time, knowing the constraints that happens in a conference, I did not want it to put those things. But I wanted to pitch few ideas and then come up with looking at how the Chinese have been trying to fill the vacuum, how they look at developmental piece rather than the democratic piece as, as a component which we can discuss during the Q&A. Thank you for your patient listening. OK, thank you, Nanda Kishore. He presented very a capsule as well as very interesting overall picture of a Chinese role in West Asia. Nanda Kishore has rightly said that China's most important, important priority in the region is uh, to ensure the uninterrupted supply of oil and of course uh, the role of uh, Chinese companies. 
uh, in most part of uh, West Asian re um, leading countries, like in, in even in uh, Iran or in Saudi Arabia, in many places. And also, he also pointed out that despite many, many uh, political issues, uh, which are very active there in West Asian states, but the role of or the importance of economic matters uh, is very, very important. For example, all the countries are uh, very much depending on economic kind of uh, uh, infrastructure or any other kind of uh, activities uh, where you know that China's role is very, very important. So China is exploiting the, the need of the, the region that much. Uh, he also, uh, you know, uh, said that China is also deeply involved in all the economic activities of the region. But anyway, it's a very good presentation on the Kishore. Congratulations. And now I <clears throat> invite uh, Dr. Ma Prishottaman uh, for presenting a paper on China, Central Asia, beyond a peaceful periphery. Thank you, sir. Uh, I hope I'm audible. Audible, audible. Okay, great. Uh, I'd like to uh, first uh, thank Dr. Sajad Ibrahim uh, for inviting me to present. Uh, and I'd like to particularly thank uh, Dr. Joseph Kuti for organizing this uh, very timely sim uh, webinar and thank the Department of Political Science, uh, Kerala University for inviting me. It's great to see some former students of mine presenting as well as attending this conference. Um, I'll just set my time over 12 minutes. Uh, um, so I'd like to first uh, kind of uh, place Central Asia within the context of uh, China's grand strategy. I think we all know, uh, whoever has done a little bit of China would know that China has had grand strategies since it's, uh, since the PRC took shape in 1949. So we have uh, the period of revolution from 49 to 77, recovery from 78 to, 70, uh, to 89, uh, building comprehensive national power to, from 1990 to 2003, and then rejuvenation from 2004 uh, to the present under Xi Jinping. Uh, so within these strategies, uh, three core interests can be uh, made out, basically of uh, security, sovereignty, and development. Uh, so where does Central Asia fit in within this grand strategy and within these core interests? And how have the Central Asian people and uh, rulers reacted to China's engagement with their countries? And these are some questions that I try to answer in this presentation. Uh, so by way of uh, introduction, uh, it's quite clear that President Xi Jinping has uh, clearly rescinded uh, Tang Xiaoping's policy of keeping a, a low profile, and he is pursuing an active foreign policy which seeks to shape China's strategic environment. And this is something which Professor Kondopoli had alluded to in his uh, very excellent uh, inaugural address. Uh, so he basically wants to shape China's strategic environment so it becomes much more favorable uh, for, the uh, for the rejuvenation of the great Chinese nation or the uh, Chinese dream. And this is exactly what we saw playing out in Afghanistan recently, uh, where China did not remain a passive uh, bystander like some countries. It tried to shape the events uh, in on the ground by engaging with the Taliban relatively easy early. And it's now increasingly showing that it's willing to take risks. Uh, so from being a regional power itself, uh, a few decades ago today china has become this global power with interests across the globe and a certain amount of capability primarily economic of course uh, to protect those interests everywhere uh, but even a global power like china cannot afford its periphery and it's important for china to have a peaceful periphery for its own development and this is where the central asian republics are uh, how the central asian republics are of importance to china uh, so it's no wonder that uh, Xi Jinping first announced uh, the uh, Belt Road Initiative, which was then called the One Belt, uh, One Road Initiative, in at Nazarbayev University in Kazakhstan in 2013. Uh, and before I move on, I'd like to emphasize here that uh, even though I'm using the term uh, Central Asia, uh, these states are not monolithic. They're very different in their own ways. In fact, uh, China itself has emphasized on bilateral rather than you know, ties with the whole region as such. Uh, so all of the uh, uh, Central Asian Republics are, of course, part of the Belt Road Initiative, which I'll touch upon very briefly. Uh, border uh, disputes between uh, China and the Central Asian uh, Republics have been largely resolved, so that's not an issue anymore. But it has, uh, but China has political, strategic, and economic reasons to uh, remain engaged in the region. Uh, to move to security and sovereignty interest, uh, one is, of course, the stability of the Xinjiang region, which is at the heart of China's security concerns in Central Asia. Uh, the Western border, 
has always been a source of tension uh, and conflict for the Chinese, even during Soviet times. And uh, Western Xinjiang is seen as a source of stability. And so for China, stability in Central Asia is essential for the prosperity of Xinjiang because it shares a very long 2,800 kilometer border with the Central Asian republics. So the idea that China has is that if it builds roads, railways, and pipelines and connects Xinjiang with Central Asia, it, uh, cross-border trade will flourish and this will help to integrate Xinjiang into the region and keep the rest of separatists in check. Uh, so in 2012, when, when Jiabao had announced plans to transform Urumqi, Urumqi into the gateway of Eurasia, building a new airport, uh, new roads to Kyrgyzstan and Tajikistan, he was basically following the advice of the very influential scholar Wang Jizi, who advocated building a new Silk Road uh, rather than focusing on the troublesome East and South China Seas because there China had competition. He said it would be better for China to march westwards. And that was the beginning of China's Go West policy, which later developed into the uh, Belt Road Initiative. Uh, Beijing's fear of growing, uh, of growing Islamism in Xinjiang, uh, Xinjiang is not unjustified. In 2015, uh, IS had re uh, released a recruitment uh, video in Mandarin accusing uh, Beijing of uh, persecuting Uyghurs, encouraging more uh, Chinese Muslims to join the global jihad. Again, in 2016, there were reports that uh, over 100 foreign fighters in the IS had come from China, and most of them, 114 from Xinjiang. Uh, several thousand Chinese Uyghurs uh, from Xinjiang uh, were found in Syrian military camps. Uh, they were members of the Al-Qaeda affiliated uh, East to Turkestan Islamic movement. Again, in 2016, there was a suicide bombing in Bishkek. So the fears are justified in one sense, but it might be overplayed. Uh, Kazakhstan, Tajikistan, and uh, Kyrgyzstan have land borders with the Chinese, and there are significant numbers of uh, Tajik, Kyrgyz, and Kazakh uh, minorities within uh, China. So uh, more than four, 400,000 Uyghurs are settled in, in Central Asia, over uh, of which around 300,000 are in Kyrgyzstan alone. And so uh, China obviously fears that uh, they would, there could be a spread of radicalism from China, uh, from the to China from the Central Asian Republic, uh, republics, if uh, if uh, radicalism spreads in these states. So China's primary aim really is uh, to uh, have a joint fight against what it calls the three forces of evil: uh, terrorism, extremism, and separatism. Uh, China has also been making military uh, inroads into uh, Central Asia. Military cooperation is has been increasing. It has uh, stationed troops in Tajikistan in the Wakhan corridor. It has held counter-terrorism exercises. Uh, the SCO has a regional uh, anti-terrorism structure. Uh, and it is also increasing military equipment sales uh, to the Central Asian countries and conducting military exercises. Uh, to come to the development or economic interests, the Central Asian republics are clearly attractive to the Chinese because they are uh, natural resource rich and China is the world's largest consumer of oil and gas. Uh, there is also the advantage of physical proximity. So the total trade between China and Central Asia uh, between 1991 to 2016 has grown 60 times to $30 billion. And thanks to the BRI, uh, China will probably remain the biggest investor in the region. It is the largest trading partner for all of the CAR, CARs. Uh, the uh, Central Asian region is obviously has uh, geoeconomic importance as a transit region. And again, this is not a recent phenomenon. It has nothing to do with the BRI. The BRI is just an extension of what happened in the 1990s when the Chinese started the Bovest program. Uh, so the, uh, the Central Asian republics need money for development, and uh, they need to extract value from their mineral resources because they are, they've not been able to really generate enough domestic finances for development. Uh, so they need large-scale investments, and uh, Chinese in investments are a means for them to join global trade because the region itself is very uh, poorly integrated. So the CNPC today has outmuscled uh, Gazprom, uh, et cetera, to become Central Asia's uh, energy giant. Uh, so China has hydropower investments in Kazakhstan, Turkmenistan, mining interests in uh, Kyrgyzstan, and potential uh, agricultural investments uh, throughout the region. There have been a number of gas pipelines. Uh, and, to, and to give uh, China credit, uh, it is the only country which has had the motivation the money and the risk tolerance to, to you know to build this infrastructure and make them work in this very very uh, difficult environment in central asia 
Uh, there are three Central Asian uh, countries in the top 50, top 50 most indebted uh, recipients of Chinese direct loans. Kyrgyzstan is fifth, uh, Tajikistan is 19th, and Uzbekistan is uh, 39th. So a great percentage of the GDP, they are indebted to the Chinese. Uh, to move very quickly to the BRI, the BRI is, of course, uh, Xi Jinping's uh, um, you know, signature project. Uh, the vision is much more about creating uh, new export corridors, importing more oil and gas. Uh, so in addition to creating you know, a regional uh, network of uh, economic dependency, uh, Beijing feels that better connectivity, like I said before, will help its uh, underdeveloped uh, borders to become viable trade zones. Uh, so it wants to establish a security cordon in uh, Central Asia, which will uh, help it to keep a lid on the ethnic tensions in Xinjiang. Uh, the diplomatic end game, whether uh, it is planned or not, is basically to bind Central Asia to China. Uh, it also uh, signals a shift in uh, Beijing's uh, geopolitical gaze, which was uh, very long focused on the eastern seaboard to, towards its land borders. So like I, uh, Tom Miller says, it marks the uh, Beijing's rediscovery of its uh, traditional continental ambition. Dr. Roma, you have uh, two more minutes, okay? Yeah. Uh, so, uh, we, so thanks to the BRI, uh, China's presence in Central Asia has been uh, in, uh, expanding because Russia does not have the mo uh, money to invest uh, in, in uh, Central Asia anymore. Uh, China has been uh, you know, uh, boosting its soft power as well. Uh, but what is clear here is that uh, instead of just building uh, large scale infrastructure projects today, Beijing's emphasis has shifted uh, to helping the Central, uh, Central Asian economies to industrialize, to upskill the workers, to increase the number of uh, local employees in all of their projects, because there was a lot of protests against uh, Chinese immigration. Uh, the uh, Central Asians, of course, need money because they don't have uh, money to invest on their own. And they don't have any other alternatives. Uh, but uh, a lot of the money that the uh, Chinese are investing in Central Asia does not leave the Chinese system because it is a loan which is granted by a Chinese bank, government, which is reinvested in the Chinese company, and then uh, they bring their own workforce into it. Uh, since I have very little uh, time, I'm not getting into individual uh, countries. Uh, so yet, uh, uh, Central Asia is not uh, China's uh, within China's sphere of influence because Primarily because of uh, Russia, uh, as luck would have it, I woke up today to news about the protests in Kazakhstan. And obviously, the Kazakhs called up the CSTO rather than the Chinese to help. Uh, the public remains wary of China. Uh, the elites might be warm towards them, but the public remains cold. Uh, the public is unhappy about uh, the repression of Muslims in Xinjiang. Uh, there is fear of becoming over-dependent on China. There is some xenophobia as well. And uh, the influx of Chinese immigrants is seen as a problem. And there is also fear that China is uh, pursuing a new colonial economic policy. Uh, an interesting aspect of uh, China's engagement is that uh, it is part of only the SEO, not other regional organizations, because they are all Russia dominated. And like all small powers in eras of great power competition, these states have increased their bargaining power and mileage and to get ba and balance between Moscow and Beijing. Uh, like in other regions, economic statecraft uh, is the primary tool of influence being used by the Chinese. Uh, this, the CARs have a role to play in China's rejuvenation because of their vast uh, raw materials. It's also useful for China to promote its uh, core security interest. Uh, and it's important to note here that uh, the, the Central Asian countries have succeeded in forcing the Chinese to change the nature of their investment so that their own countries are being uh, benefited. Uh, so, uh, while China's influence has grown uh, in Central Asia, it has not yet overtaken Russia. And the uh, Central Asian republics have been smart enough to play each uh, of the great powers against the other. I think I would end there because I think I've just finished my 12 minutes. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Dr. Uma Purushottaman. And it's a very interesting presentation, very informative, of course. Uh, some of the points I remember that the China's relation, China's relation with the region is very much based on bilateral one. And again, you know, China is very much exploiting the region because one important advantage of China is a geographical proximity. Uh, at the same time, as Uma rightly mentioned that uh, something uh, in unlike other regions of the world, uh, China is also facing some of the issues like terrorism, extremism and separatism. Uh, this is something 
you know, China uh, faces only in the, the neighborhood also. So here, Central Asia is very much also uh, that part. But Uma Prashottam, I think, a lot uh, has given a lot of idea, details regarding Chinese uh, way of investment in the uh, different states in uh, Central Asia. Okay, anyway, it's a very interesting presentation. Uh, so the last presentation is by Mr. Amal PP. Uh, he will be presenting on China in Russia. So please, Amal. Uh, hello. Yes, yes hello. it's audible. Uh, audible. Audible. Uh, audible. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Your, your camera is working, not working. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There, there is uh, some problem because I think my camera is on the reverse okay. side. Okay. It's okay. going on the reverse side. Okay. okay. Uh, <laughs> I don't know how to correct it right now. Are you in Delhi or uh, where, where are you now? No, I, I'm, in, I'm in Kerala right now, sir. Kerala right now. Okay, okay, okay. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, yeah. I think it's, now it's working. Yes. Uh, yes, it's okay now. So, so, I hope I'm audible it's right now. It is visible now. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, uh, respected Professor uh, Sajad Ibrahim, uh, Professor uh, Jose Guti, and uh, other presentees, and uh, all the participants, uh, thank you all of you. Uh, so my topic is China in Russia. So it's uh, the em emerging two global powers. The importance of China and Russia uh, is uh, it's uh, the m many find it's an alternative against the uh, unipolar world or. Uh, an alternative against Western hegemony. So it's uh, it's a very important uh, topic in the current uh, uh, global scenario. So uh, 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 while we coming to the development of uh, China as a global power, uh, China is uh, quick enough to understand from the Soviet collapse. And uh, until 1990s, uh, Russia sends greater aid to the developing China. But since 2000 onwards, it has been reversed because from the 2000 onwards, the China emerges as a global power and uh, Russia was still uh, struggling to uh, make a stable economy. Uh, and then uh, 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 as a emerging, both of the nations uh, understood the threat of emerging, uh, uh, the emerging uh, unipolar, unipolar world uh, under the hegemony of USA. And they were planned their co uh, sufficient counter actions against it because uh, they they see that uh, the U.S. support of color revolutions in the region and the NATO's eastward expansion uh, are are uh, U.S. is operating it as a re regime change strategy in Russia and China. So uh, both of both these nations find their threat and uh, also they they want to develop their economy as uh, powerful uh, nations. So uh, they, they find it's, it's uh, most, uh, uh, most apt to uh, get proper uh, both security as well as trade partnership to build it as an alternative. alternative. And uh, uh, when Russia sees uh, China's emergence, Russian Foreign Minister Yogini Primakov in 1996 he, he planned uh, uh, to build a multipolar world with their allies. So, the China started in 1996. And in of good neighbor friendship, yeah, and your voice is breaking. Amal, your voice is breaking. It is. It is somehow audible. Please try. It is not audible now. Amal. Hello. I, I think 
I think you have a network issue there. Oh, yeah, the network. Okay, now it's coming. Okay, you try. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, um, uh, first should China can take both Asia's union. And, uh, the you see, again, the of a big, which lead Russia to white at all in the region. Uh, so th th these are the positive things Russia find uh, find it uh, to do campaigns uh, to and uh, tackle these uh, Western forces. But there are there are certain things. I think Amal is out now. Let us wait for some time. I will comes within the time limit. We can manage it. Otherwise, we can conclude as it uh, evolves. Yeah, 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 yeah. Let me see. Hello. Hello. Yes, sir, Amal. Yes, sir, Amal. You okay? Uh, you continue. You have only four minutes now. You just um, uh, um, summarize everything. It's okay. Okay. Uh, we, we really sorry, sir. No, issues. I think uh, to avoid yeah, yeah. the issue. I think uh, you just uh, summarize everything within four minutes. Yeah, Three, yeah. Four. I, I just switch off my video and I'm just continue with audio. Uh, so. Uh, so there are there are uh, several issues for uh, uh, Russia to continue an alliance with uh, China because historically we can see uh, from the Soviet times onwards the no relations uh, between uh, China and uh, Russia are stable. So there are uh, this uh, Chinese migration to Russia and Central Asia, especially uh, the Chinese influx in uh, in the far east of Russia is creating uh, problems and uh, it is a reason for the future tension. And then uh, this racial discriminatory view against Chinese by Russian is also another issue. And a large number of Russians believe that a stronger China will harm the Russian, uh, Russian interest. Traditionally, uh, Russia is always more oriented towards Europe and China is more con concentrated in Asia. This these things are important in their alliance. This Chinese dominance in Central Asian markets and uh, uh, this this uh, disturbing Russia and uh, the Russian uh, on the growing competition of arms trade. This Russian uh, Russians are uh, Russian firms are accusing uh, of an illegally copying of Russian military hardware by China. And uh, uh, now when we come to the using of uh, uh, you, uh, China's using of Russia uh, for uh, for her emergence. This uh, uh, we can see that China is still the leading foreign partner and one of the top ten investors uh, and the largest importer of Russian natural gas and oil. Uh, uh, this uh, and uh, both these nations are using their uh, their own currencies for bilateral trade. And uh, in the year 2014 alone, Chinese investment in Russia grew by 80 percentage. And uh, the, uh, t for tackling terrorism and security concerns along with bilateral trade in the region, Shanghai, the Shanghai Corporation Organization uh, is an important project built by both Russia and China. And their joint military training under Shanghai Corporation Organization is helping them to in improve the national security capacity. And China knows that Russia is their better ally for development 
experimental projects as well as the emergence as a superpower. And uh, Russia's role is critical in China's connectivity to Eurasia, especially on the $1 trillion project Belt and Road Initiative and uh, its new Silk Route in, in the Eurasian region. So uh, how, how, now we can come that how, how the relation impacts to the world. Uh, that is, uh, the, the, both the countries, uh, both Russia's and China's role in the multilateral forums like UN Security Council, BRICS, RIC, SCO, and G20, they are, they are uh, taking a position uh, together in these forums and they are, they are putting, a, putting their strategy together. And, uh, and uh, it is developing as an alternative against the Unipora world uh, and uh, against Western hegemony and against U US and NATO forces. Uh, so this uh, similarly, the SCO, BRICS and G20 contribution to the developing nations is also important. Uh, now, uh, India is also a member of SCO and India is a go good contributor in BRICS. So these uh, developing nations can expect more from their alliance than the Western world. That's a reality now. And uh, Russia and China are kept away from the formation of politics of blocks. Uh, that is there always. They never built any political blocks, uh, but they, they are building just uh, partnerships and alliances. This is actually good because developing of political blocks is always uh, uh, serve the interest of the powerful that that we we seen in the history. So now this alliance and uh, partnership is better. And uh, now Russia China relations are more stable and positive today. So this is like they are building as a, their relations as an alternative against the Western hegemony and building their uh, uh, trade and market and their development in, in this way. It is like a better as an, uh, better for the uh, developing. So, Amal, Amal, one minute, one minute, okay? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm yeah, I am, I am finishing, sir. I am finishing. So, uh, so Russia-China relations are most stable and positive today with all these limitations. So this is uh, for the developing nations, they can expect something better from this uh, relation and they can, uh, and uh, as a uh, emerging uh, and uh, like in the upcoming world, it will be these two nations or uh, front will be very important as a global players. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much uh, for your patience. Okay, thank you, Amal. Uh, despite um, uh, some technical issues, Amal presented his paper almost uh, uh, within his time. Uh, his presentation, of course, uh, you know, very much uh, brought out the kind of uh, the complexities in the China-Russia relations. Although uh, the background, uh, one may feel that it's quite smooth, but according to Amal, there are issues, some of the issues he also pointed out. Uh, for example, the kind of in which, uh, you know, arms trade kind of uh, issues. Then also China, the China's dependence uh, on, uh, you know, Russia's uh, natural gas kind of things. And at the same time, he also mentioned that um, China is not very much, China-Russia kind of uh, political blocks are not existing. Rather, uh, these powers are very much interested only um, alliances based on partnership. But there is a much scope for their uh, relationship in the, the overall uh, benefit of the, the global, uh, you know, global situation, for example, against uh, uh, American intervention, American hegemony, for example. So anyway, thanks, for, um, thanks to Amal for his presentation. Now, I think there is no time for a, um, a question answer session, but still I feel that one, uh, we can take uh, a couple of questions, but not answers uh, because answers will be given through a uh, chat box, I think it's better. Okay. I think it would be the right. And if anybody feels that much concern or questions, uh, um, or no, a couple of questions can be admitted within like a 20 seconds questions. Uh, so they can be put in the chat box. The answers can be put in the chat box. You can also raise questions in the chat box. Those are the, the concern um, resource persons would be answering it. Since it's a lunchtime, I think everybody is quite hungry. So 
they must be very hurry to take their lunch avoiding any questions i feel like that okay i think it's better to stop here i i'm not going for any further uh, conclusion of this session because i have already briefly narrated all the presentations so it's a very good presentations by all people i should thank dr nandakishore for his uh,